Hey everybody, David here, and today I want to tell you my top 10 favorite Pixar moments that make me cry. Uh, now, let's face it, Pixar has the, the ability to make all of us cry. And look, I'm not ashamed to admit there are many moments that get me misty-eyed or sometimes all the way weeping. And uh, these are the 10 moments that I think affect me the most whenever I watch these Pixar films. So I'm opening up a little bit to you guys and letting you know <laughs> the 10 moments of Pixar that, you know, there's a part of me that likes it when I cry during these films, so or get misty-eyed. And uh, here are the top 10. Let's get straight into it. At number 10, I have The Incredibles, uh, the scene where Mr. Incredible uh, tells his wife, you know, when they're about to go into battle towards the very end of the movie, they're, they're heading out, there's this machine, the, the robot is attacking the city, and he tells his wife, uh, you know, the wife is, uh, Miss Incredible is asking, like, what, what's the problem? Why can't we go with you? Why don't you want us to go with you? Because uh, he's telling them to stay where they are, just stay here, and I'll go take care of it myself. And then he finally bursts out because I can't lose you again. And, you know, as someone who, you know, I, I'm not married or anything, but I do understand the value of family and not wanting to lose your family. Um, so, and, and especially since you realize that he almost lost his family earlier, you put that connection and you feel for him. Uh, definitely. And I'll, I'll admit, man, every time he says that moment, that moment he says, I can't lose you again, the, the tear, the eyes get misty, I'll, I'll admit. And I'm like, oh man, that, that is a powerful line and a powerful moment for me in the first Incredibles movies. Something that I was kind of missing in the second Incredibles. I like the, the second Incredibles movie a lot, Incredibles 2, but I'll admit, it was missing that aspect, and I kind of wish it had it. Uh, moving on to number nine, I have uh, Wall-E. I have the ending of Wall-E, and uh, at the end of Wall-E, if you remember, Wall-E sacrifices himself to get everybody to Earth, and it's the way how Eve re reacts to Wall-E not uh, alive anymore. It seems like, and then when she brings him to his ship, she you know, charges him up and he comes back, but he doesn't remember her at first. Or, you know, he just acts like a, a mindless robot when, you know, we know that this robot was able to feel and live and, you know, react to things. And now all of a sudden he's like a brainless robot that just goes back to working and what he was originally built to do. That's not who Wally is. And then finally, you you start to, there was something, I forgot right now exactly what it was that reminded him. Uh, but it, obviously it, it brought, it, there was something that hit him that started uh, making him remember. And he does a subtle move and that's what turns Eve into realizing, oh shit, he does remember. Or at least now he does. Um, so it was a nice, really nice moment for, for people who was falling following uh, Wally's journey uh, from beginning to end. At that end made you realize, uh-oh, is he not going to be the same Wally that we loved throughout this entire film? And then you realize, yes, the, the Wally that we knew is still there. So uh, th that's definitely another scene that gets you very misty-eyed. At number eight, I have uh, Monsters, Inc., uh, the ending of Monsters, Inc., where this is literally the very end <laughs> of the movie, and I'll admit, every time it, it comes up, uh, I the tears, they always get ready because they know uh, it's coming, where it's revealed that Mike fixes the door uh, where Boo comes from, and he brings Sully into this room, shows him the door, it's all fixed, and Mike is like, oh wow, you don't know how much time it's passed, it could be a week, it could be a month, who knows how long it took for Mike to put the door back together. Uh, but what really gets to you is when he's opening the door and he's looking for Boo and all of it, he says, Boo, are you in there or something like that? And you hear Boo's voice. You don't see Boo, but you hear Boo's voice. And uh, she says, uh, oh man, what did she call him? 
she calls him the, the thing that she always calls him, the nickname she gives to him. Uh, so, uh, Kitty, that's it. She calls him Kitty, and w once you hear that voice, you know, y you, you tear up. I, I'm gonna admit it. I, I, the eyes get misty for that scene, so there you go. Uh, at number seven, I have uh, Cars. That's right, Cars tears me up in the scene uh, towards the, the last race at the end when uh, it's the final lap of the race and Lightning McQueen stops and you're wondering why is he stopping like he should be finishing this race right or else uh, Michael Keaton's character is gonna ch Chick I think it was uh, is gonna beat or Hicks Chick or Hicks I don't remember uh, <laughs> Michael Keaton's green car character uh, passes the finishing line and why does Lightning, McQu Lightning McQueen stop he stops for the king the king is the older character, the older car character, who announces earlier on in the movie that he's going to retire after the last race, um, and to show respect to the older car, because obviously he's, he uh, had a lot of time with uh, Paul Newman's character, Doc Hudson. Uh, after spending a lot of time in Radiator Springs, he's learned a lot about respecting uh, the elderly and respecting everybody, for that matter. Uh, that he uh, decides to help the king finish the race because it wouldn't be the king's last race if he didn't wasn't wasn't able to finish that race and it, it makes that scene even more powerful when you know where uh, in Cars Three where Lightning McQueen ends up. Uh, so I I kind of like uh, I, I kind of like I I think it makes Cars Three a, a little bit that's why Cars Three is a little bit better to me. Uh, than Cars 2, because Cars 3 actually kind of brings it full circle when you watch Cars 1 and Cars 3. Uh, there you go. So, yeah, Cars 1 definitely has that moment that tears me up. Uh, moving on to number 6, I have Finding Dory. I don't have, I'm going to tell you now, I don't have Finding Nemo on my list. I have Finding Dory, the scene where Dory finally finds her parents. Uh, obviously, they, they make this big build-up that she knows where her parents came, where she came from and where her parents go. And they, they make you think that she's going to find them until she gets to the aquarium and finds out that they were deported. At least that's what she thinks because they, they got rid of all the, the blue tang fish uh, a long time ago. And then it seems like when all hope is lost, she's like drowned into a drain and gets back into the ocean, separated from Nemo and Marlin. And you think, oh, crap, what's going to happen now? Like, the, it seems like, like all hope is lost. That's what Pixar likes to do. They like you to make th that things are all hope. All hope is lost. And just when you think all hope is lost, she starts seeing shells on, on the seafloor after trying to look for help. She follows the shells and you start connecting the pieces. You remember, wait a minute, her parents used to lay shells for her. And when she finds this place, <laughs> just thinking about it, it's like she, she turns around and she sees her parents. And it's such a, a strong moment in the movie that, uh, man, it, it tears me up. It, it, one tear has to come out during that moment, at least. Uh, it, it, it's such a powerful moment because you're, like, rooting for it. And when, when they make you think that it, it's all done and over with, there's no hope, uh, they, they realize, now there's hope. <laughs> there's hope in finding Dory's parents, and there they are. So it was a really nice moment in her hugging her parents. And then when she says to them, I'm sorry for... I'm sorry for, you know, leaving. And her parents tell her, don't be sorry. You know, you have nothing to be sorry for. Uh, man, for any parent that has uh, kids maybe with a disability or, you know, someone that blamed themselves for something that they weren't really at fault for because that's just who they are, uh, it, it's such a great moment. I, I it tears, just thinking about it is tearing me up right now, so... Uh, moving on to number five, I have Ratatouille, Anton Ego's uh, review. Um, <laughs> this, who knew a review could make me cry? As someone who talks about movies, I, I guarantee you, none of my reviews make anybody cry, unless they're really bad. I don't know. Uh, but yes, the review at the end, where Ego is talking about how anybody can cook, it always tears me up, because... This review doesn't have to pertain to just cooking. It could pertain to 
anybody. Anybody can make a movie. Anybody can cook. Anybody can write a book. Anybody can do anything they want if they push themselves to learn and to work hard at it. And that's what I felt the message of the movie was. And that maybe as critics, we shouldn't be so harsh. I'm not as harsh on movies or uh, as a lot of professional critics are. You know, I don't want to call myself a non-professional. But like, yeah, I, I wouldn't call myself a professional. I, I just do this stuff for fun. I like talking about the movies I love. I don't like bashing movies that I didn't like. Uh, that's why I try to avoid movies that I'm not going to like, because I, I just want to talk about the ones that I do like. Um, and every time that, that message comes up, as someone who wanted to be an actor and didn't take those steps on becoming one, um, it, it does hit home. And uh, I, I think a lot of people can, if they really search down within themselves, they could think like, you know what? Maybe I can do that. I, I hope more people listen to that kind of message and, and use it to push themselves forward. So moving on, uh, at number four, I have Inside Out. This is Riley's confession at the end of the movie. Uh, throughout this entire movie, we're seeing what's going on in Riley's brain. And as, as the story continues, we're seeing things crumble inside of her head. You know, she, she's losing parts of herself. Uh, they're crumbling inside after she moves to this new place. Something that I think a lot of kids can all go through. You know, I was a kid that moved away from an old area that I used to live at and then had to adjust to a new life. Um, to be fair, I never really had much friends in both areas, but um, I, I can feel that place of being alone and even at one point, maybe even running away. Um, and it, the movie really the tears really start coming. There's a couple of moments that really, and this was a hard one to pick because I'm like, what? I want to pick one moment for each of these movies. And I would say the, the moment that really hits home is where she confesses to her parents on what the problem is that's bothering her. Uh, because that's the point in the movie where you realize sometimes sadness can lead to joy. And sometimes the sad moments are in our life, you know, will one day we'll look back at it and maybe we'll realize that they will lead to somewhere positive because the sad times can make us stronger in some ways. And that, that, that's the way I looked at that, that moment. And when she starts crying and all that, it, that's to me the weak point because it's like she's been holding all this stuff in this entire time. It's time to let it all out. And sometimes that does help a lot of people. So... Moving on to number three, I have Toy Story 4. Obviously, this is the most recent movie, and one that whenever this scene comes up, oh man, I can't hold it back. It, it just comes out. The scene where Woody finally says goodbye to everybody, and it you, you know it, and we know it at the time, especially when Buzz says, She's going to be okay. You already know who she, he's ta referring to. He's not talking about Bo Peep. He's talking about Bonnie. Bonnie is the little girl who, who takes care of all the toys. And obviously, it, it shows that sign she's not really playing much with Woody uh, lately. And uh, when, you, when you see that and realize who Buzz is referring to, she's going to be okay. It, it's, uh, it's, yeah, see, <laughs> I, I'm already holding back the tears. It's, it's such a great moment and a powerful moment at that. And you know this is probably the last time you're going to see maybe most of these characters. And to know that this is the way Woody separates himself from them, I think it's a very uh, strong moment. So there you go. Moving on to number two, I have Toy Story 3. Uh, this was tough because there were two moments I could have picked. But I'm pick picking the very end, obviously. The, the, the ending of this film. Jesus, if you don't cry, I... I these last two movies, if they don't cry, I don't know what 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 to do with you guys. Uh, Toy Story three, when Andy finally has to give his toys away to Bonnie, the one who eventually gets tired of Woody. Uh, she, you know, it, it was 
taking a lot from him because he had a grown an attachment of these toys, especially Woody. Uh, but it's when, you know, he's taking all, all the toys one by one. Mr. Potato Head, uh, Rex, Slinky, uh, Jesse, Buzz. But it's when he gets to Woody, that's where you're like, oh, man. You know, because Woody is the, the one he cherished. He didn't really want to give him away at first. But then, and it's a, it's a really great moment when she recognizes him and tries to grab him. But then Andy grabs him back and uh, <laughs> you realize, man, that's the toy that he grew up with. That's his buddy. You know, Woody, Woody is the one that he didn't want to separate with, but he's he's going to. And he does. And then you see him playing around with his toys one last time before he leaves off to college. It's such a great moment. And then obviously when he's driving off and he he looks at them like, holy cow, like, uh, <laughs> like I'm actually doing this, you know? And he, he leaves and then Woody, so long, partner. It's, oh man, the, the tears just come out and... Uh, you, you, you lose control because you're letting go of something that you really love. And sometimes we got to let go of the things we love uh, in order to move, move forward with our lives. So uh, <laughs> there you go on that. Finally, I didn't know I was going to try to hold back tears throughout this entire video, by the way. Uh, finally, the last um, <laughs> scene in my uh, top 10 Pixar moments where I cry. Uh, Coco. That's right. Coco, where Miguel uh, sings to his grandmother, Remember Me. This song, first of all, the song alone can get you to probably, if you listen to the soundtrack, uh, that song alone will get you to cry just by listening to it. So add on the meaning and the context to where that song is played at the end of the movie, Especially when they play it early on, but they sing it like they have the bad guy singing it early on in the movie, like very right at the very beginning, but he's not singing it the way Miguel is going to sing it near the end, or the way Hector sings it uh, in the middle of the movie, uh, to where he reveals that he's, you know, uh, the, the father of uh, Coco, who is Miguel's grandmother. Um, but then having Miguel sing it to remind his grandmother to not forget to not forget uh, her grand her father uh, it that is a powerful moment and you know nobody wants to be forgotten in this world no one wants to forget the people that they loved in this world uh, and that's why I think we cherish photographs and, and videos that we have of our family and friends uh, because we don't want to forget them and this is Oh, man, it's such a great moment in that movie that it's impossible to to hold back those tears. So there you go, guys. Those are my top 10 uh, moments of uh, Pixar scenes that make me cry. Apparently, even when I think about some of them, I, I start to get the waterworks uh, going a little bit. So uh, hopefully you guys can share down your moments. Sometimes it's good to cry. It's not a bad thing to cry. And some people think, oh, I'm too manly to cry. If you're a guy that wants to impress girls, first of all, some girls like it when a guy cries. Uh, secondly, when you try to be manly about things, you act like an asshole. Uh, sometimes it's good to just let it out. And, and show a sensitive side of yourself. Uh, it doesn't make you uh, any less different from who you already are. Uh, it, it shows that, hey, this guy has a caring personality. That's the way I look at it. So, and anybody should be able to crack these films. Uh, sometimes, like I said, for the inside out scene, sometimes it's good to cry. So there you go, guys. With that being said, I hope you guys like this video. Please subscribe to my channel. And please tell me your favorite uh, uh, moments that make you cry. What are some of those scenes? Uh, I'm sure everybody has a moment or two or more like I did. I had 10 moments here. Some of them made me cry more than others, but there you go. With that being said, until next time, uh, take care.